Uh, kia ora koutou. Can you all hear me at the back? All good? Hi, my name's Dave. For those of you who don't know, uh, I work at Auckland Museum and for the last wee while uh, I've been doing clever things with pictures up there. But first of all, um, I'm going to take you on a little bit of journey through this talk, really. Um, and in order to understand that journey, we need to go back in time a little bit. To learn a little bit about where I come from, to understand the perspectives that I'm about to try and share with you, to show that digitization isn't all that. So some time ago, prior to me working in this sector, before I had lots of grey hair, I used to call myself a photographer every now and then. I even left the country once and put it on my little departure card as I went through the airport. It doesn't happen these days. I very rarely take pictures both at work or in my personal life. But it has led me to kind of look at most things uh, through the eyes of visual language. And about, ooh, about 10 years ago, I fell into the glam sector. Um, and that's important to note because I fell into the sector. I didn't train to work in this sector. I didn't want to be a historian. I kind of sucked at history at school. I came into it because it was a career route for me out of retail using technology as a vehicle. And so as I've come into that, what I've done is kind of bring that visual language into it, but perhaps none of the sort of normal things that most of the people in this sector bring with them. And over the past 10 years, I've been fortunate enough to be involved in a lot of different projects at different organizations. I advise on a lot of other ones, both here in New Zealand and overseas and into Europe and the States. I'm really lucky to have worked and published a book. I led the digitization program alongside my former boss, Alan, for the New Zealand Defence Force personnel files. So all of you who have been looking into the soldiers' histories and reconnecting with your ancestors and so on over the past few years since they were put live, that was some hard work that we did at Archives making that visible. I led the digitization of the police review into the crew murders. I led the digitization of the women's suffrage petition. So every time you've seen bits of data in the last few years and you've been reconnecting with those names of your family and your ancestors, that came because myself and some of the guys that we worked with, who are probably here in this room somewhere, actually checked every one of those names one by one as we scanned them. And more recently, I went up to Auckland Museum to go and lead their collection imaging project. And we built a state-of-the-art studio. It was one of those rare moments in history where we got a, great, a clean slate and told, go nuts, make what you need. It doesn't happen very often. <laughs> it doesn't happen very often. And we built what we wanted. And it was awesome. So during the time that we've worked on this, we've had, the, I suppose, the fortune of having a purpose-built facility with purpose-built processes and people in there working away. And we've shared. We've had over 8,000 people come through that studio as visitors, as teachers, as students, as people visiting alongside our partner project, the Pacific Collection Access Project, we've shared what we've done. And we re-identified. The museum, I think it's fair to say when we arrived, it wasn't completely against photographers, but there was a bit of legacy resistance in there. Some of us, we weren't really that liked when we first turned up. And in those last four or five years, what we've managed to do is take doing pictures and turn it into a way how the museum has rebranded itself. You can't see a corporate document, a report, a hit on the website, a billboard on the back of a bus or anything like that without our images being a thumbprint all over that stuff. And we reinvented. Some of the things that we've digitized is the first time it's been done, including figuring out how to image bats underwater and how water acts as lenses on color. And nobody had done that before, and we figured it out, and we've shared how we did that. And perhaps more importantly, we relied upon people. I've had the fortune of working with eight of the most amazing staff over the last five years. Photographers, our rights specialists, who's gone on to leave us and, and lead this sector, as well as honorable mentions for some really, really amazing kind of people that worked alongside us. We've had the first volunteer program with photographers coming and working in the museum and teaching them how to do it. It's been amazing. We delivered 275,000 new images and a bit more. 
and over 67,000 objects were digitized. And these are complex things. They're not, you know, sheets of paper that we're putting on a scanner. These are three-dimensional objects that look weird and wonderful and shiny and complicated and a bit tricky to image. And I'm really, really proud of that. As we've digitized things over this past period, it's been like a new dawn. It's been amazing. <laughs> and it really was. It's been beautiful, what we've done this past few years. And if that sounds a little bit evangelical, it's because it is. I'm really proud of it. It's been amazing what we've done. They have been the wonder years of a digitization project. And one of the things that I've realized over this past kind of six months since that project's closed down, and reflecting on the similarities between that and all of the other projects that I've seen, is that most projects have this. Most projects have a period where everything is awesome and it goes really, really well. Most projects have a wonder years moment. And then something happens. Then comes the end of things. Then comes the bits that hurt. Then comes the death scene. All things must end. And sometimes like that, it's painful for a good reason. It has to be. But all things must end, and it hurts. So as we've been in that sort of period, trying to figure this out and trying to understand it and reflect on those similarities, I've come up with a few ideas, and that's really what I want to try and share with you today. So for a start, most projects seem to be a boom and bust cycle. Okay, Some genius out there goes, boom. You know what? We've got a bright idea. We're going to digitize all the things. And all the magic fairies kind of wave their wands and things start happening. And the project gets underway. People start doing cool stuff. And you build a momentum. You build a body of work. And things get better and better. People like what you've done. They talk about it. Everybody loves who you are. And then something kind of inevitable happens, usually involving some dollar signs, right? Either your money is running out. You've spent it all. Well done. Or hell. This is really expensive to do. And inevitably, there's a decline and a head downhill until you hit that death scene. That death scene hurts. Whether you are like me at the end of the project, along with some of my colleagues, we've been fortunate enough to be able to continue on and carry on working at the museum. We did survive. Some of my colleagues didn't. They've left us. They've gone on, and we've lost that talent. But even for those of, you, uh, those of us who are left behind, we still go through this period where we ask that question, are you going to survive? Because you're going through like a grieving period inside who you are about the end of that project and the end of that era. The wonder years are over. But what I've really found quite interesting is after that, when you've had your crunch and you start to get your new ideas and go, do you know what, there's still work to do, that's when the creativity comes. You're being forced to have to rethink about how you do what you do and why you do it. And you climb back up until you hit the next genius idea and start again. And I want to introduce the idea that digitization is a foundational element. To give Auckland Museum a lot of credit here, it's been really, really good at pushing this agenda. But what I've realized is that most organizations, those core business elements, your curators, your archivists, your librarians, your art historians, those people who know all of the things about your collection, that's your core business, right? That's the bit everybody is like really focused on. And digitization, often in many organizations, is that bit that's bolted on the side. It's a necessary, I wouldn't say evil, it's just one of those things that has to get done. But not everybody's bought into it in a lot of organizations. But it's wrong. Auckland Museum has pushed this, and I'm certainly pushing the idea that digitization is a foundational element of every single thing that an organization does. <coughs> you're not putting an exhibition on the floor or a gallery on the floor. You're not doing marketing. You're not doing research on your collections. You're not publishing your books. You're not updating your website without having the thumbprint of digitization all over it. So it is a foundational element of, what's, of what a, a modern organization is. So now you've all... See some smiles. Now you've all been there, you've been listening a little bit. It's audience participation time, right? So I want your shoulders loo loosened up and I want hands in the air. 
Not just yet. There's a question coming, okay? Next slide, there's a question. If you think the answer is yes, I want your hands to go up. If you think the answer is no, leave them down. Okay, are we all ready? There's some nods, so I'll, I'll take that as a yes. Is this cool? That's, that's interesting. That's a 50-50 in the room. I like that. I quite like the fact it's got a shiny bit in it and it looks a little bit gold. But to me, and I'm not a rock nerd slash geologist, that's a rock. It looks a bit pretty, but it's a picture of a rock. It's kind of cool, but it's not going to get me really excited. How about now? They're the photos that one of our photographers took in one block of work of rocks. One block of work. Not all of it, just one person in one block of work. So when you're doing over two and a half thousand photographs of rocks, that not everybody here in this room was totally enthused about, I start to ask a couple of questions. Why are we doing it? And is mass information actually enough? So you're all loosened up now, you're ready to play the game, okay? More audience participation. Who here in the last month has spent more than an hour meaningfully using Wikipedia? And I don't mean like looking up how old George Clooney is <laughs> or anything like that. Meaningfully contributing, working with, learning from Wikipedia. What's that, like 15, 20? Let's say, we'll be generous, that's 20% of the room, okay? How many of you have used Instagram for an hour or more in the last day? That genuinely surprises me, actually. <laughs> that genuinely surprises me. I probably used it for like an hour before I had breakfast this morning. <laughs> so my point is, come what may, this is the world that we live in. And I don't really care whether you like it or not. This is the world that we live in. There is a chimpanzee who may or not have been trained, but fully autonomously checking himself out and his mates on Instagram. <laughs> this video did the rounds on the internet earlier on in the year, and I find it fascinating. We, as a sector, are one thing, but we operate in a much, much bigger world where most people think like this. Bite-sized, visual snippets of information that become consumed, adored, and disposed of really, really quickly. And I know what you're saying, Dave. It's a bit extra. Like, know your audience. Don't bag everybody who's already here, right? There's a little bit much. A bit unnecessary. But my point is really significant, I think. We live in a void, as glam digital geeks that we are, that does not, I don't think, accurately represent the visually-led world that most of the rest of the world live in. This came into my email box in the last week. This is Air New Zealand and National Geographic. Not New Zealand Geographic, but National Geographic, talking about a project that they're doing. I think the phrase is, uh, young locals from challenging backgrounds. Basically, you know, kids are having it tough. And they're using photography as a vehicle to try and help them. Now, what interests me in that is not necessarily uh, the, what it is that they're doing, admirable effort, great idea, but the fact that realistically two brands are using photography and imaging as the sexy vehicle on which to hang their latest goodwill gesture to society. I, I wonder why that as opposed to anything else. Imaging is at the forefront there of how people associate visual culture, I think. And so as I look at all this sort of stuff, I sit there and go, digitization's been a really big deal, right? And we've pushed, I've pushed for so long to try and digitize all the things. But I'm not really sure it's enough anymore. And I'm prepared now to start kicking up a bit of a fuss and trying to change people's ideas, change people's ideas. I think we need to start digitizing for impact. If when we do digitization, it's not causing a big bang effect, why are we doing it? We exhibit for impact. We put a gallery or an exhibition on the floor. I don't think I've sat in a single meeting in the five years I've been at Auckland Museum talking about a gallery or an exhibition where people haven't used the word engagement. 
probably about 45 times in every meeting. <laughs> it's all we want, right, is engagement from people. Be that in a personal connection or a visual connection. The last couple of exhibitions we've put on the floor are hugely visually led and visually stimulating. We publicize for impact. Whether it's a report or it's an advert on the back of the bus, anything that we do, an Instagram post, is trying to grab people's in attention through a personal connection or a visually led wow moment. But we digitize for people like us here in this room. And I'm just gonna let that sink in for a second. We digitize for people like us. We do it to serve our industry. And I'm sorry, but Dr. Phil speaks for me a little bit on this. I don't quite get it. Why exhibit and publicize for impact, but not digitize for it as well? So I wanna try and introduce the concept to, to you guys of digitization, yes, awesome, and I'm not trying to say to anybody anywhere that digitizing your collections is a bad thing. It's awesome. Go ahead, do it, get it out there where it's appropriate. Don't do any uh, sort of cultural appropriation and all that dodgy stuff. That's not cool. But get your stuff out there. Digitize your stuff. It's awesome. That's the yes bit. And digitize for impact. And do you know what? If your organization can't afford to do digitization projects, do the and because I believe that's where the impact is. We need to digitize to make human connections. Those NZDF records, frankly, are quite boring to look at. They're bits of paper and microfilm, and they mean nothing until our ancestors are reconnected with their modern day family. The women's suffrage petition is a pretty scraggy looking roll of paper. It's not cool to look at, but it contains some of the most iconic moments in history and connections for people in a meaningful level. I want to digitize our insects so that they don't look like they just smashed into the windscreen of a car, but they look like artwork. I want to digitize our war diaries, not for the words that's on the page, but to make them look evocative. I want to digitize our toys that we've got chucked in the back of the cupboard and make them look like they've had a Miami Vice treatment. I want to digitize artwork, and instead of thinking of it as an archival piece, I want to try and reconnect with what the artist was thinking when they made it, to try and understand it like they did. I want to create a few nightmares and send a few kids to sleep at night with a few tremors, quite frankly. <laughs> digitize an old dodgy bat in such a way that it looks that cool, it gives people the willies. Because why not? I want to digitize our collection objects and spend so much damn OCD time lighting the things that they can't help but be perceived as works of art. I want to take our cultural icons and give them a sense of personality and natural science specimens and make them come to life. Our old objects and treat them with a sense of reverence for what they are, some heritage and feel. And also be intimidated by just how damn big they are. <laughs> And then go around and digitize the damn things, not to look archival, but just to make them look cool for the sake of looking cool. Five years ago, I was in the audience down in signings, and this slide came on the screen. Up the punks were talking about how they were trying to save the history of New Zealand punk music by digitizing content and getting it online. Because the people who were involved in those moments were actually starting to uh, lose their history, some of them were passing away and getting ill, and it was being lost. Digitization was their vehicle for that history to not die. But I think there's a new hope. <laughs> That's thrown me, that. <laughs> there is a new hope. For me, it's not just digitize or die. It's digitized to connect. It's digitized to feast your eyes. And it's digitize or die. There is a new dawn upon us. And I think if we don't start looking at the post-mass digitization era and start thinking about what's next and how to connect with people, we're already behind the times. Thank you very much.
organizations that haven't yet done the mass digitization and I'm from the University of Otago connections to the Hocken University of Otago library do people need to go through the mass digitization digitization or die before they get to the impact or is it something that you can just let I mean do we need to do the coal uh, environment destroying coal power mass industrialization before we get to clean green technology or can we just jump straight there I it's a very good question. I genuinely feel now that that's up for debate. Um, I'm not trying to say that people shouldn't digitise and add to the corpus of knowledge that's out there, because that's awesome. Um, and you know, the work that our sector and overseas have done on that in the last few years is fantastic. So if you can, yeah. Um, if you can't, I still think it's worth doing the, the other stuff, because I think you will still have the impact, and you'll be spending a lot less money doing it um, and you're still generating the connections and the meaningful bit to people I think so yes and is the answer to that All right, thank you Uh, I wanted to know, in terms of digitization, most of it's been focused on static images, but what you were talking about with Instagram and things like that, people's consumption of media has changed, there's like things like boomerang shots and, and mm. having many videos. Is it a case that we now need to start considering moving beyond images? Uh, yeah, I genuinely think that's something worth looking at. As we close the project down um, at, at the end of, sort of June, and we were in a replanning phase. One of the ideas I was trying to float past my two photographers that remained on board with, with the team is to no longer think of digitization as putting an object down in front of something and to start thinking about it, how you can make it into something more. Um, I had bright ideas, for instance, about trying to illustrate squid accelerating through the water using smoke and light. Um, I don't know whether that was video or not. I probably have had a go. But I'm actually quite, I haven't got time to do it yet, but um, I'm actually quite interested in trying to um, re-visualise collections in ways that are just plain cool and make people stop dead in the tracks. If that's video, if that's different ways of photographing it, uh, but even if it's 3D scanning or anything like that, honestly I think that's up for debate. I think it was a pretty clever idea. Lucky last. <laughs> I might have misinterpreted when you said the and bit because then you started going into the visual impact of taking pictures and making them look fantastic because I was looking at it from an archivist's point of view and from my point of view sometimes we have to do that digitization because we were introduced to a, a new term which I thought was a spelling mistake but digitalization which are the opportunities that are brought out in the communities once digital content has been made available. Yep. So from my point of view, it's not so much digitising for us, it's getting banks of archival material out there to see what people are going to do with it, how they're going to map it, how they're going to revision it, how they're going to make it important for their communities. Um, that's where the and sits for me, it's no longer where the digitisation is, it's what's going to happen out there that I have no, I don't know yet, that's the big unknown of what happens when people get lovely collections of high resolution digital data that is freed up and not behind paywalls or anything like yeah, that. Yeah, yeah. See, I think that, that's just a matter of perspective because I look at that exact same thing as the yes part. That's just basic digitization. Then release it and let the world go nuts with it. Yeah. Um, and do whatever it is it, it, they need to do with it. Um, typically, it's their information anyway, and we're just looking after it and making it free again. Um, and I really advocate for that. I think it's an amazing thing to do. But for me, when you're in an organisation and choosing whether to do digitisation or not, that's part of that, do we do it yes or no question. But I also want to throw the idea out to everybody here and anyone who's listening, that let's do that, awesome, that's good, that's step one. What's step two? Because I think there's room for both.
Thank you very much, all of you. Thank you.